Okay, section 15.2, the equilibrium constant. So let's take a look now at this idea that N204 is in equilibrium with 2NO2. And we have a, the case where the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate, meaning the speed of the forward reaction is the same as the speed of the reverse reaction. N204 is forming NO2 at the same speed that NO2 is forming N204. Okay, Those rates are equal to each other. So now let's be a little bit more mathematical about it. This would be Kf for forward times concentration of N204. And experimentally, it's been determined that the exponent there is a 1. And so that would be equal to K reverse times the concentration of NO2 to the second power, the second power being determined experimentally as well. Suppose we were to do the following. We divide both sides by the concentration of N204, and then we divide both sides by Kr, K reverse. That would give us Kf over Kr, and that would be concentration of NO2 squared divided by concentration of N204 to the first power. Now what's interesting about this result is that what it tells us is this is a constant here and this is a constant here, right? Those are both constants and the ratio of constants of course is a constant. So if that's a constant then this on the right side has to be a constant as well, right? You can't have a constant equal to a variable, right? So that means that that ratio is a constant, and that's an important find. In fact, it's so important that what we're going to do is we're going to say that that ratio is equal to something called big K, capital K, EQ, and we're going to call this the equilibrium constant. What it says is that for a reaction, there is a constant. And that constant in this case, for this reaction, is the concentration of the product, NO2, to the second power, divided by the concentration of N204 to the first power. We call it the equilibrium constant. Since we are using concentrations in our units, we often put a C underneath it. So big KC, meaning concentration. That's just telling what units we're using in our brackets, okay? Concentration units. So we have something called the equilibrium constant, or K sub C, and that is equal to the ratio of the rate constants, okay? Now, here is a little bit of experimental evidence to support this claim. So what we're going to do for this particular reaction is we're going to run a couple of experiments. I'm just going to show you one or two. Or two. Your textbook does five of them, but I'm just going to show you two. By the way, the data that I'm getting here is from your textbook, table 15.1. Okay. So in the first experiment, we have a concentration of N204. And the concentration of N204 is 0 0.670. Let's assume it's in moles per liter. And the concentration of NO2 is 0 molar. Okay. Now, those are initial concentrations. Now, we're going to have equilibrium concentrations. So in fact, just to indicate their initial, let's put a little zero underneath here like we did in kinetics. Those are the initial concentrations, okay? Now let's do equilibrium concentrations. So after the reaction has come to equilibrium, what are the concentrations? Oops, sorry, this is NO2. Make a little typo there. 
Okay, so if we start off at 0.670 and 0 for the initial concentrations, what are the equilibrium concentrations? 0 0.0, I'm sorry, 0, 0.643 and 0, 0.0547. Okay, so those are the equilibrium concentrations. Now let's do another experiment. In this experiment, we're going to start off with different initial concentrations. We're going to start off with 0.446, so that's a little bit lower, and we're going to start off with 0.0500. Okay, so these are different initial concentrations. We're running a different experiment. So you know, we went through this whole thing about how uh, the rate of a reaction depends on the initial concentrations. Here we're changing the initial concentrations. And let's see what we get for equilibrium concentrations. For the N2O4, it goes to 0.448. And for the NO2, it's 0.0457. Now, there's not much we can really get out of that information right there. If you take a look what happened, we decreased the initial concentration of N2O4 somewhat. We increase the initial concentration of NO2 somewhat. The equilibrium concentration of N2O4 decreased uh, in experiment two relative to experiment one. That's not surprising. And the concentration of NO2 was a little bit less in the second experiment than it was in the first. Okay, all right, so what does that mean? Well, here's what I'm gonna claim. If you do this calculation of Kc, for experiment one and two. Now, how do we do that? Remember, we took the concentration of NO2 and we squared it, and we divided that by the concentration of N2O4, okay? So if you do that for this particular experiment, experiment one, here's what you get. 4.65 times 10 to the minus three, okay. You can check that. In fact, I recommend you check that. Take the, not the initial concentrations, but the equilibrium concentrations. Those are what you're going to use for this calculation. See if you get 4.65 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, what about experiment 2? If you do the same calculation for experiment 2, you get the same answer. In fact, in table 15.1, they show five experiments, and they get the same answer every time. In other words, it doesn't seem to matter what the initial concentrations are. If you vary the initial concentrations, this ratio, this equilibrium constant, is the same once the reaction comes to equilibrium. So that tells us that there's something significant, something important about this constant. And so that is what we're going to spend the rest of this chapter, some of chapter 16, some of chapter 17, some of chapter 18, and some of chapter 19, on this idea of the equilibrium constant, K sub C, it is a very important factor in our understanding of chemistry. Now, let's generalize this. I just showed you for one reaction, N2O4 becoming 2NO2. Let's look at it in a more general way. So this is what we refer to as the general form for equilibrium for Kc. It's the idea that, let's say you have two reactants, A and B, and they are capable of forming C and D, and this is a reversible reaction. We can write the expression K sub C as the concentration of the first product raised to whatever the exponent is, I'm sorry, raised to whatever the coefficient is, this little c, times, not plus, I'll put a dot there, times the concentration of the second product raised to its coefficient, that little d goes over there. So if little d is a three, then it would be raised to the third power divided by the concentration of A raised to the coefficient in the balanced equation times the concentration of B raised to the coefficient for B. B the coefficient becomes an exponent. So that is the general form for Kc for two reactants, two products. We could expand it to three reactants, three products, or two reactants, three products, or one reactant, one product. 
So let's see how that works, for example, for this one. We know what the answer to this is because we've seen it before. Okay, so according to this, you take the product and you raise it to the, to the uh, coefficient. So the coefficient for the product is a 2. So concentration of NO2 squared. And then there's only one product, so divided by the concentration of the reactant raised to its coefficient. Well, the coefficient is not written there. That means it's a 1, so this is just a 1 there. So that's what we saw earlier. That is the equilibrium expression for that particular reaction that we've looked at. Okay, So this um, is the general form for equilibrium. So this constant writing expressions, that's something you're going to practice. And now, suppose we're not at equilibrium. Suppose that it's in some other state before equilibrium. Then how do we deal with that? Because remember, K is the constant that corresponds to equilibrium. So if we were to have, for example, NO2, I'm sorry, N2O4 becoming 2NO2, remember we put in there time and concentration of N2O4? You know, it's going down, but then it kind of becomes stable. And then this is where we're talking about equilibrium, where it's not changing anymore. Well, what about over here? What's going on there? Can we use K there? And the answer is no, we can't use, that was a rhetorical question I answered very quickly. You can't use K there. K only works when the concentrations are no longer changing. So this is the region of K. So here, what do we do? Well, what you do is you generalize it even more. You create something called a reaction quotient. And the symbol for that is a Q. And we're going to use concentrations again. So I'll put a C there for concentration. And this is essentially done the same way you would with the equilibrium constant, but it's valid at any time. Not just at equilibrium. OK, so even at the beginning, when there's initial concentrations, you could use it. So same idea. What you would do is you'd say, hey, suppose here's our reaction. And we're not at equilibrium. Well, if you're not at equilibrium, then you don't do Q KC. You do QC. You calculate Q. And it's done exactly the same way that we did for the equilibrium constant. It's just that it's valid in different regions. It'd be. Um, an analogy to this would be that if you were calculating Newtonian mechanics, sorry, this is a B, Newtonian mechanics, you, you would use the general same form of your equations, whether you were on the Earth or you were in another solar system, but certain constants would be different, right? Like gravity, the masses of the planets might be different, the mass of the star might be different. So you couldn't use exactly the same constants that we use here, um, like g, 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, but there are general forms. There's general equations that you could use that would work in a different solar system and would work here. Here's that general form for chemical equilibrium. Whether we're at equilibrium or not at equilibrium, we can calculate the reaction quotient. Now, if the reaction quotient turns out to be equal to the equilibrium constant, then that's just a way of telling us that we're at equilibrium. Okay, so here, out here, QC would equal KC. But here, QC would not be equal to KC. There would be a different value there. And we'll get into all kinds of calculations on that when we start looking at some of the problems. So that's reaction quotient. Okay, now, oh, by the way, this whole discussion here of this equation here and all this, there, it's just to give it a name, it's called the law of mass action. It's a cool name, mass action, right? Sounds really cool. Law of mass action. So chemists want to have some laws just like the physicists do. So here's one of our laws, the law of mass action. Okay? So now let's move on to an issue which is how do we interpret the value of the equilibrium constant? I haven't given you any numbers for equilibrium constants. 
but that's an important aspect. In the end, the numbers are an important consideration. So let me talk a little bit about the numbers of equilibrium constants. So one thing we can say is that k can be small. It can be really small. Okay. So for example, you could have a k that's equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 31. It's possible to have numbers that small. That's a really small number, right? But they can also be very large. You could have k equal to 3 times 10 to the 42. That's a possibility. There are some processes where you have equilibrium constants that large. So tiny, 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 very, very large, right? You can also have in between. k, c can be in between. So it's possible to have k, c be 0 0.5. That's a possibility. That's like almost 1, right? It's a half. So you can have really extreme ranges of equilibrium constants depending on the process. But how do we interpret that? So here's how we would interpret it. Let's say I'm going to take a very simple reaction, A goes to B. And I'm going to say that K is equal to a modestly large number, 100. Okay? Well, what is K equal to? For this one, it would be the concentration of B at equilibrium divided by the concentration of A at equilibrium, right? B over A. Products over reactants. By the way, when you're doing these things, products over reactants. That's the terminology we might use. So don't do it the other way. Don't do reactants over products. Um, so if it's 100, what does that mean? Well, what that could mean, we could interpret that as meaning the following. Suppose I had one A. How many Bs would I have? What you do is you look at this ratio, 100. The ratio of B to A is 100. So if I have one A, how many Bs do I have? You'd have to have 100 Bs to give you the ratio of 100 to 1, right? If I had 10 A's, I'd have to have 1,000 Bs because 1,000 over 10 is 100, okay? So in a sense, if this is large, and I'm going to say, you know, not compared to this number, but that's a relatively large number, 100. What that means is you have a lot more Bs than you have As. Only one A, but 100 Bs. So large K means much more product than reactant in the mixture. So what happens is if you look at this 10 to the 42, that's such a large number that that's essentially seeing there are no reactants. The, react, the amount of reactants is almost zero because a number divided by something that's close to zero is very large, right? So that's one interpretation. Now, suppose we do the opposite. Suppose we say that we're going to have an equilibrium constant that's pretty small. So let's say that K is equal to not real small. I'll make it 0.1. Okay, and it's A goes to B. Okay. Well, let's say that I have 10 A's. There's 10 A's, right? How many B's am I going to have? Let's take a look. Okay, so the concentration of B over the concentration of A is equal to the concentration of B divided by 10, right? I just told you we have 10 A's, so this is a 10 down here. So how many B's would you have to have? Well, let's figure it out. Obviously, some, some of you will figure this out pretty quickly. It's just an issue of how easy it is the math is for you. Okay, well, let's just solve for concentration of B. What's 10 times 0.1, right? Well, it's equal to 1. So that means there's only one B in there. So if you have 10 A's and 1 B, you get an equilibrium constant that's equal to 0.1. So a small K, one in which is less than 1, just means you have more reactants than products. Okay? So small K means 
more reactants than products at equilibrium. That's what that means, okay? So small a, I'm sorry, small k means more reactants than products. Large k means more products than reactants. If you had the same amount of reactants and products and these exponents were one, then that would mean you have equal amounts, right? You can put that in there. If you have an equal number here as to what you have here and here, that's gonna give you a ratio of one, right? So if they're equal, you'll get one there. But keep in mind, when you're doing these equilibrium expressions, sometimes you might have an exponent that's not one, right? And that, that affects things mathematically, but that's essentially the idea, okay? So the magnitude of the equilibrium constant we can use that magnitude to interpret the meaning in terms of how much react and how much product we have relative to each other because this is all about ratios. So ratios are fun to work with, division, fractions, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to enjoy this. We're going to do a lot of problems on these.